years ago, my dad started no-till farming. It's been nearly 30 years ago, um, seeing the benefits of moisture conservation. Uh, moisture is, is typically our yield limiting factor, our most limiting factor that we have in this, in this uh, area. As we switch to no-till, we've seen benefits from that, from soil conservation, moisture conservation. Um, we're still, in, in order to increase our production, I think there are other practices that need incorporated into our operation to promote water infiltration, as well as water holding capacity that we can utilize that moisture that we receive sometime throughout the season that we can utilize that for the growing crop to, in order to increase our yields. So we've recently um, adopted cover crops into our rotations, especially in the dryland. We're, we're putting it in after wheat in our, in our dryland cropping rotations in order to um, aid in our, primarily in the water infiltration. For producers, improving soil health means increasing their water infiltration rates so that they can have extended production um, through, through droughts or through a dry period. It can decrease irrigation water use, it can increase fertility of the soil, decrease nitrogen needs, input needs, input costs, as well as increase you know, yields. It just seemed to make sense. We were seeing a lot of ponds in fields and the word was that cover crops and no-till will help your infiltration and let the water land somewhere and soak in the same spot and it has worked. We don't have near the ponds we did. Those places are finally growing a crop. The earthworm channels just let everything soak in. They let the water have a place to go. The roots have a hole, a channel to follow. All that slime that the earthworms make is good for the soil aggregate. Um, yeah, they're just a great thing to have. Every time you dig for seed, you find one. The other thing is it's so cool that people are learning. I think before, it still is, it's been real easy just to uh, turn the plow and just to spray. You can't do that anymore because fertilizer and herbicides and things have gotten so expensive and consumers won't allow it and they shouldn't allow it. It's made people be much more aware that I can't be in a vacuum on my farm. And I think people are getting so far away from the farm. Like I'm on our 4-H board and I was in 4-H for 11 years and I'm very thankful our neighbors got involved. But we have a real challenge that so many people are so far away from where their food comes from. People don't really grasp, well, if I spray this or Chipotle puts it out or whoever, well, there's always two sides to it. And so you, there has to be more of an education process and changing dynamics. Otherwise, uh, you're not going to keep raising things. and You just can't keep increasing your yield. You've got to do better with what you have. And in part, people have done that to themselves, producers, that we've got to do a better job of collaboratively working with the public. Well, it's, it's all about education. I mean, education is, is so critical because, you know, we didn't grow up learning this or knowing this. We didn't learn it, you know. Now, if we'd have been born 100 years ago, we would have learned it from our great-grandfathers because they were doing many of these same concepts. But we've forgotten that over the past several generations. So it's all about education. As a company, we probably spend five times more on education than we do on advertising because we're convinced that if we can, if, if, if a farmer understands what's going on in the soil, cover crops, you know, they'll sell themselves. So we don't have to advertise if we can educate. And I think that's where you know, NRCS and other organizations like that have such a strong role to play in being at the forefront of that education uh, because you know, the, the farmers you know, are gonna look to NRCS, they're gonna look to the NRDs, they're gonna look to Extension for that information and so if if we can you know if those groups can all work together to provide that you know, training to provide that uh, education uh, not only at the producer level but also at you know a level of other decision makers uh, landowners you know if we can if we can get landowners to understand how this is improving their soil and how it's improving the value of their soil then they'll start demanding that their tenants do some of this. Part of the reason that I, that I have had interest in is I work for an order supply, which is a full service ag input retailer, sell chemical seed fertilizer and custom services. So in that role, we get a lot of customers that inquire with us about what do we know about cover crops? What are our experiences with it? What can we help them with? So part of, part of the reason that I've been so interested in it is to find a way to help our customers better 
So been available th through the NRCS. Um, did, like I said, we've, we've done our, our various strips of cover crops, no cover crops, different blends, different mixtures. Also did a trial this last year of monocultures. We did 20 some monocultures so that we could see how they, how well they were, how easy they were to establish, how, what their growth patterns were and, and what challenges there might be of, of planting through them the following season. So we took customers on a tour and, and help, we're helping customers to uh, make plans as they're looking to incorporate cover crops into their operations for various reasons, which everybody has a little different reason. We were wondering what's next in the future. Uh, we've got some traditionalists out there who want to keep doing it the same way. Uh, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting something different. Well, we started thinking about that in production agriculture. Uh, farmers have been doing tillage for years. They always got about the same yields, hoping that technology would save them. Turns out when we parked the tillage tools, went to no-till, built soil structure, built soil resiliency, built soil health, we increased yields. And now there's a lot of those farmers who've hit a new plateau as well, and what do you do? So now we start thinking about cover crops, we start thinking about crop rotation, start thinking about diversity. And every time we've got to do something to raise us that next plateau, that next level. Again, my crystal ball is not good enough to know what that is, but I know that a lot of it, we didn't do it 100 years ago. Our grandfathers were organic producers. Now you say that today, people cringe a little bit, but organic producers, they were doing it without purchased inputs as far as fertilizer, herbicides, insecticides. They're managing that with crop rotation, with diversity, with uh, site-specific management. Well, the, the soil health test uh, is, is new, interesting things as far as I'm concerned. And we have the guys that have been no-telling for a number of years and getting into cover crops. And now we're discovering that if we do those things, we get a more diverse uh, population of microbes in the soil. And those microbes are doing a lot of things for us that, that I'm trying to learn. And, and the exciting part is that for years, I talked about just kind of, so to speak, pouring on nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium kind of things. And now, now you got to stop and think, now, if you're doing this, I think you can get by with less of nitrogen or whatever it is. So, so from my standpoint, it's making me a better soil scientist because I'm paying attention to the part we ignored for years. At this point in the youth of soil health, um, we're having to learn this as we go. And so we're, it's, a, it's definitely a two-way street as we, as we work through each individual process with, with each farmer. Each case is different. Um, the weather is different and we, we learn so much every time we put this on the ground and we walk through it with them. The soil health indicators show us that, that in improvement through time and the soil testing that we can do and we can sure there's, there's a lot to learn every time we, we implement this on the ground with the landowner. There's a no-till tour I did years ago and uh, there was a commercial vendor on that tour and he says I can't believe no-till farmers. He says they're willing to tell, share their secrets. You know, in industry, usually we don't share secrets. And I, I sort of love that idea about no-till. Uh, if you're successful at it, you're proud of it, you're helping build for the future, you're gonna share that with others. And that's where we like people like Mike and others who are doing that.